Horror movies have existed for as long as cinema has existed, and while we can look at the classics and remember them fondly, one less glanced at area are movies that exist in the public domain. A movie in the public domain is one that can be viewed for free. You don't have to pay the original author, you can download it or play it anywhere. And, most importantly, for the case of this video, you can resell them. Hiya, I'm Golden, and today I'll be taking a deep dive. A really deep dive. What I've got is a big movie box set, Mill Creek's 50 Horror Classics Anniversary Edition. Mouthful of a title. It's full of public domain movies, and I'll be going through them all for this video series. Now, just because a film is in the public domain doesn't mean it's bad. It could be a case of the proper copyright credentials not being assigned, or just the copyright lapsing. Many movies fall into the public domain for a reason, but that's the exercise here to find some hidden gems. So sit back, relax, and I'll dig through this pile of coal to find some real diamonds. Or flawed rubies, in some cases. Also, mild content warning, there's going to be some outdated views of racial stereotypes here. Certain depictions of race were considered okay at the time some of these movies were made, and that sucks. Also, I'm going to say the fuck word a lot, so be warned. One more content warning if you're someone who really cares about quality. The visuals of these movies are going to be all over the place. I'm pulling from a variety of sources. Some of these movies I'm ripping directly from the DVDs of the box set, others I'm finding online. But many of these films only exist in poor VHS rips, so prepare your eyes to be assaulted by low resolutions. Gonna be looking at these films in alphabetical order, so we can get a real smorgasbord of quality. We've got vampires, werewolves, zombies, daikaiju, weird melty-faced men, weird melty-faced skeletons, Talking people in suits. Talking plants. A whole variety of subgenres and theming. Let's go. I wasn't expecting to find genuine quality this early on, but hey, The Amazing Mr. X is pretty alright. The film follows a woman named Christine and her sister Janet who become enchanted by a mysterious self-proclaimed psychic, who's really a phony. It's a classic case of spooky gaslighting. The psychic takes advantage of them by using imagery of Christine's dead fiancé. It gets a little convoluted, though, as it turns out that the dead fiancé was alive the whole time. Since I'm believed dead, I could even kill a man. Nobody think of looking for me. And he demands that the psychic continues to con his ex-wife for her fortune, though the psychic begins to have second thoughts about it. How exactly Christine doesn't notice the crappy audio quality of the record that's playing her ex-husband's voice, I don't know, but whatever, suspension of disbelief and all that. The strongest element of this film has to be the cinematography and lighting. Characters are often framed as soft silhouettes with even softer lighting. The vistas are picturesque. The blocking of actors feels very purposeful within the context of scenes. They didn't just flatly shoot the actors like a cheap stage play like in movies we'll see later in this video. It's got that old-timey pacing you'd expect from a dialogue-heavy horror film and many moments read as unintentionally corny, but if you can acclimate your tastes, you'll find a classy flick with excellent visuals. Decent movie. I'd say it's worth checking out. If any husband of mine ever chased me into the ocean in the middle of the night, I'd shoot him. The Ape inexplicably stars horror legend Boris Karloff as a scientist trying to find a cure for polio, specifically for a girl in a wheelchair he has a friendship with. It's working. My child will walk again. Meanwhile, a man in a shitty gorilla suit, I mean a definitely real gorilla, has escaped from a local circus and is killing people. After an altercation in Karloff's lab, the gorilla starts running around taking people's spinal fluid. Yeah, I wonder what happened there. The gorilla suit they use is so unconvincing that it couldn't be anything but a fake gorilla in the context of the story, and even then, the gorilla is supposed to be real for the first half of the movie before Karloff starts running around dressed up as a... Karloff does a good job playing the soft-spoken scientist. He's always a class act, even in lesser movies. Am I gonna die? We all have to die sometime. But he can't do much to elevate this stinker. The cinematography issue I talked about during the Mr. X segment is present here. It's shot like a stage play, as many B-movies were, and it's visually uninteresting as a result. The movie is tonally dry in a way that doesn't excite like I thought it would. I mean, come on, it's about Boris Karloff running around in an ape suit killing people. I thought it'd be more fun than this. The movie even lacks the mystery element because we already know Karloff is the ape, but so much of the film is spent focusing on boring characters trying to figure that out. Do apes ever return to the scene of the crime? They're noted for it. Barely scraping past an hour, it's 
not one of the worst movies on the list, but there were better ways I could have spent that hour. The sacrifices scientists had to make before finding the cure for polio. Dressing up as gorillas and stealing spinal fluid. It's just tragic. Atom Age Vampire, made after the Atomic Age by releasing in the 60s, and also doesn't feature any vampires, is an English dubbed version of an Italian movie named It's about a woman who is disfigured in a car accident. Allegedly. She's disfigured forever. It depends on the lighting. The transfer of the movie is so bad that early on you can't even tell if she has scars in some shots. Anyways, she's given a special serum, her face is cured, and she inexplicably falls in love with her doctor. Unfortunately, the serum doesn't last very long, so the doctor has to resort to killing other women to keep the serum active. So, right out of left field, he injects himself with a modified form of the serum, and this gives him a melty face and monster claws if he goes on a what killing spree. Playing, <laughs> it's basically a less good eyes without a face, with a shitty monster thrown in there. It's got some atmospheric visuals at points, something the shitty transfer doesn't do justice, but this movie isn't much to write home about. The dubbing is poor, the editing can be pretty shoddy. Oh dear. Especially considering that they probably cut out a lot of footage for this version of the movie. It's a very standard mad scientist turned monster in the loose story. Not a lot to talk about here. I was on the verge of sleep for most of this one. Thoroughly unremarkable. On to the next one. With a title like Attack of the Giant Leeches, I picture a schlocky, atomic age adventure about giant leeches. And while the movie does have that, you unfortunately have to suffer through what this film considers people. You're my wife. I'll touch you anytime I feel like it. The film opens pretty strongly. There's a cold open where a guy encounters the leeches for the first time, before the title card. You know, this introduces intrigue, suspense. And the movie tries to maintain this throughout with its slow pacing, but it kinda sucks. From there, the movie splinters into two storylines, one where a stone-faced action man and woman investigate the leeches, and one of the greasiest couples ever gets involved in some shite melodrama that ultimately ends with leech death. For a movie that's barely over an hour, it easily feels an extra 30 or so minutes longer. It keeps stopping for these needless tangents and scenes that don't add anything. Do you want some coffee? It doesn't help that this movie is dark as hell. Not tonally, but visually. The night scenes are so murky that it's hard to read some scenes, even in the higher quality resolutions that I've seen. I get not wanting to show too much of the monster, because you know, sometimes less is more in terms of building tension, but every scene outside at night or dusk looks like this. I will say though, this movie achieves the ambiance of a thick murky swamp. The sound design on these outside scenes works well enough. That said, I don't think there should be howler monkeys in the deep American South. You know, I, I never thought that of old Dave. Maybe it's the leeches. And yeah, when the giant leeches actually show up, they look alright. They look pretty cool, actually. There are things in this movie that almost work. The music has that cool 50s theremin sound. But man, it just can't hold my attention for the final 30 minutes. Scenes feel so stretched out, there's probably a better 40 minute movie within the 62 minute one. It's so boring. It's the cinematic equivalent of having a headache on an overcast day, if that makes any sense. Someday I'm gonna give that she-cat a whopping she's been asking for. The Bat is a 1959 horror mystery about a conflict revolving around an enigmatic serial killer, the Bat, who invades a country house occupied by guests. The dialogue and character banter is the film's strongest element. It's got a pretty snappy screenplay and it leads to some hilarious interactions. If you can find another body instead of Sam's, it's all right with me. We've got to get out of here. Out the back way. We will. As soon as I provide that body we were talking about. That said, the banter doesn't end. There's too much of it. And a consequence of this is that it doesn't leave much room for tension. For a supposed horror film, it's not very scary. The film never breaks its stage play cinematography either, so even the titular bat is just... 
there. He's shot from either a wide or a close medium. He just looks like a guy. The lighting is there, but the camera work is so static and bland. Very non-threatening villainous presence. The performances are generally good though. I love seeing Vincent Price in anything, but yeah, it's a decent movie. Doesn't blow me away or anything, but it's alright. It's Clue for Boomers. The Beast of Yucca Flats is a unique kind of bad. The kind of bad where almost every aspect of the filmmaking process was done incorrectly. The beast finding his victim gone unleashes his fury. And as a result, I think it holds the candle as one of, if not the worst movie of all time. It's about a Russian scientist named Joseph Dvorsky, noted scientist, who is mutated after stumbling into the Yucca Flats nuclear testing center, and, like, he gets bacon on his face. He finds a young couple and takes the woman. Then two policemen try to rescue her, but find out she's dead. Then two kids go missing, and the rest of the movie crashes from one loosely connected plot point to the next. If you feel charitable enough to call these plot points and not procedurally generated NPC events. The entire thing was shot without sound which is actually a fairly common technique in filmmaking, especially at the time. Most old Italian movies were shot like that and have audio added in post, which actually does wonders for Sergio Leone's work and gives it this unnatural edge. It sounds unrealistic, maybe a little piped in, especially when half the cast is speaking their own language and getting dubbed in later, but at the end of the day, the lack of filmed sound is planned in advance. Leone crafts a scene using the lack of sound as a stepping stone for creativity, letting the musical score, often done by Ennio Morricone, do the heavy lifting. Start. But Coleman Francis is no Sergio Leone. A man runs, somebody shoots at him. The film does not make clever use of its silent image, opting instead to loop the same music track over and over throughout the entire film, without consideration for timing or even context. And having all the actors speak their lines off camera so the obvious dubbing will be less obvious, even though it just draws more attention to the fact that they dubbed the entire thing. I can't find him. The titular beast is just some guy, played by Tor Johnson, and he spends the entire movie stumbling around waving his arms in the air. There's this whole ten minute sequence where a Korean war veteran chases after the dad of two missing kids and it ultimately just adds nothing, it doesn't serve the plot at all. As a matter of fact, what is the plot of this movie? The entire thing is just people wandering around in the desert while some fucking psychopath rambles about flags on the moon and the wheels of progress. Flag on the moon. How did it get there? Touch a button, things happen. Vacation time. People travel east, west, north or south. Nothing bothers some people. Not even flying saucers. It's barely feature length, and that's the nicest thing I can say about it. It's mercifully short, clocking in at about 54 minutes. Awful in just about every aspect. The Beast of Yucca Flats is one of the worst movies I have ever seen. And I've seen fucking things. Hmm. Hmm. See what we have here. Mm hmm. Black Dragons isn't really a horror movie. It straddles the line a bit, and it has more in common with a straight thriller. A bad one at that. It's a hastily constructed wartime movie starring Bela Lugosi as a foreign spy, killing American government officials. And for the most part, it's a pretty dull flick. But the twist at the end is so silly that it is worth noting. It's a crap movie, so I don't really feel bad about spoiling it. You can skip to the next section if you really care. Hell, a bunch of online sources already spoil it in the plot synopsis. But it's revealed that Lugosi's character is doing plastic surgery on Japanese guys to have them impersonate American officers. And keep in mind, this came out like right after Pearl Harbor. Really laughable, but the rest of the flick isn't worth sitting through. Even the ending is comically abrupt. Bad acting, hokey dialogue. I gather you're not frightened either. A busy man has very little time to indulge in feminine emotions. It reeks of a cheapo B-movie. Just some disposable low-budget feature made to fill time. Don't have much else to say about this one. Next. All men are in danger of dying. The important question is when. Ever read The Most Dangerous Game? Bloodlust, with a exclamation point for emphasis, is basically that. 
The plot follows a group of 20-somethings who travel to an island for fun only to find themselves trapped and hunted for sport by a reclusive yet sophisticated host with a knack for taxidermying rubber people. The lust for blood. Hey, he said it. It's an unabashed ripoff of most dangerous game, but it's watchable. It's a worse version of something that already exists, but if you held me at gunpoint and forced me to watch it, I wouldn't have the worst time. Some shoddy filmmaking here, pretty sure they bumped the camera in this shot, but eh, overall it's some mid-hokey garbo. You could do much worse. Sadly, Bluebeard is not a horror movie about a pirate, and even if the title character had a blue beard, then we wouldn't be able to see it because it's in black and white. But the movie's still okay. It stars John Carradine as a charming yet mysterious puppeteer who moonlights as an infamous serial killer known as Bluebeard. When a new woman catches his fancy, one who offers to make dresses for his puppets, he begins his standard operating procedure of disposing of his last girl to make room for the new one. Visually, the movie has two banger shots right at the get-go, but the rest is kind of flat looking. But the set design is pretty consistently cool. I don't see a lot of John Carradine movies, but despite his inconsistent accent, he's actually pretty darn good in this managing to play the character of Bluebeard as successfully suave and sinister. One thing that gets tiring very quickly is the film's score. It's rarely appropriate, playing high-energy music you'd expect to hear when characters are frolicking in the daisies, not casual or even serious exchanges. A few weeks, and you think you'll come back to me again? I think you'd better go now, Renee. Oh no, not this time. There is never a quiet moment in Bluebeard. The soundtrack is overbearing and detracts from the overall picture. As a whole, though, it's a competently made feature that falls just short of being a minor classic. I would let you turn against me too. Oh no, not you, Lucille. Not you. Let me die. The brain that wouldn't die. A woman dies in a fatal car accident. Unfortunately, her fiancé is a brilliant brain surgeon and he's able to keep her alive as a head on a table. Despite her pleas for death, he wants to keep her alive, and he immediately sets out to find her a new body, by going around and looking for suitable candidates in the sleaziest method possible. Unluckily for him, the head of his fiancée, named Jan, begins to develop telepathic powers and starts communicating with a monster in the closet. Yep, it's just as sudden in the film, too. Together, they hatch a plan to stop her deranged husband from killing another woman in the name of science, while also killing his assistant because he was a prick. It's basically eyes without a face, except it's a head without a body. And there's a shitty monster thrown in there. I can see his hairline. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's the cat. Got a little bandana. <laughs> yeah, it's, this is a bad movie, but it's definitely in the realm of so bad it's good. Hey. From me? <laughs> it's trying to be taken seriously, but there's just so much about it that it turns into an unintentional comedy. But with this serum, it, it began to breathe. It's impossible. Lady, you're a disembodied head. Nothing is impossible. The weird thing is, this movie could have worked. Even if you kept the monster and the telepathy, there could be a legitimately impactful movie here about grief and an unwillingness to let go of someone due to tragedy. But they fumble the ball so hard here because none of these characters are likable. The fiancé character is a full-blown one-dimensional villain. He's not trying to save Jan because he loves her, but because of what it would mean in the name of science. The whole telepathy thing is completely baffling. It's a supernatural element out of nowhere in this movie that otherwise tries to quote-unquote ground itself in absurdist science. So what, if you lose your entire body you gain heightened senses because all that's left of you is a head? It's fucking ridiculous and I love it. What I don't love is the film's pacing. There are several scenes towards the middle point or end of the film where Jan and her fiancé assistant argue back and forth about the ethics of keeping her alive versus what it means to the world of science, and it goes on and on and on, and they keep making the same points. It's just so boring. The scenes where the husband is going around trying to pick up girls are a drag, too. The fiancé is an irredeemable prick. Ridiculous dialogue, ridiculous execution of this premise. I highly recommend watching this movie with a group to riff on it. It's gloriously schlocky. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! He's been defeated. I like that he had tape ready. Like, perfectly mouth-sized tape. Like, he's been eyeballing it. Yeah, he just, like, had it in the corner whenever he needed it. Carnival of Souls is 
Legitimately a great movie. Following a car accident, a woman named Mary travels to Salt Lake City, repeatedly losing her sense of reality while finding herself drawn to a rundown amusement park. It's really a movie you need to experience for yourself. Me describing everything that happens really doesn't do it justice. There's a running theme of disassociation and not feeling comfortable around other people, and it's wrapped in the aesthetics of surrealist horror, and it has this really great atmosphere. So many sequences in this film are genuinely haunting and uncomfortable. One or two moments, like, actually activate my fight-or-flight response. That said, you really have to be in the right mood to enjoy this one, and what that mood is exactly is something I still have a hard time pinning down. The film can be too slow for its own good, and yeah, some of the acting is a little cartoony. It was that man. That man. But it took until this viewing for me to truly appreciate the elements of it that really worked. It's easy to see how something like this became a cult classic. Wait until the sky gets dark, turn off the lights, turn off your phone, and prepare yourself for one of the horror genre's most underrated minor classics. <laughs> the Corpse Vanishes, another cheapo Bela Lugosi picture. Unrelated, but the only production note for this film on Wikipedia is that filming began on March 14th. Knowing this film released a couple months later, it really goes to show how fast these movies used to get pumped out. I'm stalling because I don't have a lot to say about it. The plot revolves around a series of mysterious wedding deaths related to orchids. It turns out they are not dying, and are in fact passing out so Lugosi can extract fluid so that he can keep his elderly wife young. Gotta be honest, this flick is so plotting I couldn't help but check out halfway through. At least Lugosi is actually trying here. It's painful seeing him in these Poverty Row productions knowing he's capable of so much more. But these were the only movies he could find work in, so he just had to roll with them. Next movie. <laughs> Remember that one clip from the Malcolm in the Middle intro? Well, this is the movie it's from. I love you till the day I die. Creature from the Haunted Sea is a Roger Corman flick. This spy, espionage, comedy, monster movie follows a group of characters getting away in a boat with Cuban gold. And sometimes a monster appears. There's a guy who makes animal noises, and the main character is a massive simp for this lady who's very clearly not into him. This movie doesn't take itself very seriously. I mean, with a monster like that, of course not. But the pacing is horrendous, and the goofy humor wears out its welcome. Huge chore of a movie, but it has a couple funny bits. Roger Corman made a lot of shitty movies, but one thing he excelled at was finding work for up-and-coming artists, many of which we'll see later in this video. Creature from the Haunted Sea, however, does not feature many of these artists. Its legacy is primarily as a two-second clip in the intro of a sitcom. Is what I would be saying if Robert Town, who played the simp in this movie, didn't go on to write some banger movies, including the Academy Award-winning screenplay for Chinatown. My cold got worse overnight, and now I sound like this. So you get to hear a different voice for a, for a little change of pace. I mean, you should be lucky. You should feel lucky. This is this is nice. You get to hear my voice at a deeper pitch. Anyways, Dead Men Walk, our first vampire movie of the video, and gotta say, Producers Releasing Corporation is one of the most non-specific, generic company names I've ever seen. That's like naming your book company the Book Releasing Corporation. After becoming a threat to society, New Dracula is murdered by his doctor brother, so he comes back as a vampire to take revenge by sucking the life out of his niece. Apparently, the doctor can't do anything to stop this. Why not assign someone to look by your bed every night? Don't want to take any chances, right? Anyways, New Dracula sends his assistant to stir up some shit, and it ends in a big fiery climax where he becomes involved and starts play fighting with his bro as Fritz eats the corner of a column that fell on him. Too much action. Let's just cut back. Well, what is this editing is not... Not doing... Not doing too good. Yeah, this is a pretty middling feature. It's a step above what Monogram was doing, but it still has that stench of mediocrity that doesn't make it worth watching. Bad acting from the supporting cast, New Dracula has no screen presence. It's just kind of lame. Chicago light of people in hats! <laughs> the boys are coming. It's called the Godfather Trilogy. Now, that was a big shock, seeing his name in the credits, being a director of some critically acclaimed stuff. I had some high hopes going into this movie, you know to see where he started. <laughs> oh boy, another monogram movie. This isn't the first in the video, but with the first being Black Dragons and the second being The Corpse Vanishes, 
I did not have high expectations going into this one. Instead of Bela Lugosi, they wrangled poor Boris Karloff into it. After the head of a shipping company is murdered... What the fuck? <laughs> what got thrown? <laughs> Mr. Wong, a Chinese investigator, is called in to investigate. And... Uh, oh. Oh no, that's um... That has not aged well. So yeah, Boris Karloff in Yellowface is asked to investigate the owner's death to prove that his son didn't do it. It's another monogram film. A lot of people in suits talking. Outside of the horrendous yellow face that makes Karloff look like a corpse, there isn't much to talk about here. There's some snappy dialogue, I guess, but the film is a plotting snooze fest of people in suits talking about things. Why is this in the horror movie collection? There aren't many things that make it a horror movie. Is it because Karloff is in it, and he's adjacent to most horror movies? Is it because he's in Yellowface? Is the racism the scary part? You know, what I like about B-movies from the 50s is that they usually had, like, some cheapo guy in a monster suit. Movies in the 40s, they had guys in suits, and guys in suits, and guys in suits. Talking to other guys in suits. Even if a movie's garbage, if it has a little monster guy in it, it's like, oh, cool. oh, how fun. The first silent movie of this video, and the first to be over 100 years old, Jesus Christ, everyone in this movie is dead. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one of the earliest adaptations of Robert Louis Stevenson's novel, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Gotta say, they don't make hats like they used to anymore. I know this movie is, even by then, it was a period piece, but, you know, they need to bring these back. Dr. Jekyll, a philanthropist and scientist, is interested with separating the good and evil aspects of the human personality. As Jekyll is challenged by his peers and tempted by his immoral side, he manages to create a potion that literally separates his two personalities, his evil side being the horrible deviant Mr. Hyde. Throughout the film, Jekyll allows Hyde to come out more and more often, and it ends with tragedy. It's a classic story that has been retold many times, and this film is novel for being one of the first cinematic retellings. With stellar sets and costume design, it's a pretty good movie for the era. There's this one real freaky scene where Mr. Hyde is represented as a big hairy spider that envelops Jekyll as he sleeps. Pretty good movie, but it's not a major classic like some of the later silent movies in this video. You should check it out regardless. Okay, so apparently the Mr. Wong character has existed in magazine publication for years, even before these movies. And Doomed to Die was an adaptation and a sequel to this film, which also unfortunately features Karloff and Yellowface. I know this may be shocking, real shocking, but uh, I'm not interested in finishing this one. I've come to hate monogram movies with a burning passion. Next movie. Please. Finally, something more my speed. A giant monster movie. Not sure why it's on this horror box set. I'd categorize it more as science fiction, honestly. In a town with a guy who can't stop propping his leg up in uncomfortable positions, a giant mutated Gila monster keeps flicking cars off the side of the road with its tongue. As the body count rises, the police... lurches into action, kinda trying to figure it out. It isn't until the final 20 minutes when they find out there's a big lizard running around, and the leg guy bravely takes on the Gila monster with a bunch of nitroglycerin. Yeah, it's pretty dull as far as monster movies go. The Gila monster is barely in the movie and most of it is two characters standing in a variety of locations talking about what may or may not be happening. Okay, I'm, a, I've, I'm, I'm gonna say it now. Like, this, needs, this is definitive at this point. This guy is at least a little fruity. <laughs> When the Gila monster shows up, it's adorable, and the miniature sets they made for it are pretty cute too. But so much of the movie's runtime is spent on slow dialogue scenes. The giant Gila monster is a bit of a drag, but it's nice to see a monster movie for once. Hey, my voice doesn't sound congested anymore. I really hate to do this, but I have to stop the video here. There are many, many, many more movies to be looked at, and I was originally planning to make this one big long video, but YouTube likes consistent upload schedules, so for reasons related to stress, I gotta stop this here and make this a multi-part series. You can actually watch part two right now on my Patreon. It's available to those who are pledging to the $5 tier. It'll be up on my Patreon for a week, and then I will make it public. But yeah, thanks for making it to the end of the video. Let me know how I did in the comments below. I, uh, I really appreciate the uh, feedback and critiques because this is something that I've really been looking forward to doing for a very long time. So thank you.